And I would now uh, invite Professor Rohit Saxena, the Chief Instructor, to speak on do and retraction syndrome and a customized approach, something that you know challenges all of us. Uh, thank you, Ayers, for giving us the opportunity. Those of you who were there in the period of Thal Day yesterday would have a sense of de deja vu because it's the same talk I gave yesterday. But, uh, but yeah, Duans is something that we are still learning. So hearing it again and me speaking it again will give fresh thoughts and fresh ideas as we go along. So uh, a quick understanding of pathophysiology. It's an extremely interesting strabismus. Now we've kind of clubbed this and these type of strabismus into a very nice composite name called just CCDDs, uh, which actually translates into a very difficult name, but means that we really are not sure what we are talking about. So uh, congenital cranial disinnervation syndromes, essentially saying that at birth, they had abnormal innovations, and that is the manifestation of that that we are seeing. So a part of this is uh, Duans, the most common kind of a disinnervation syndrome. And essentially what is happening in this is that initially there is subnormal development or subnormal innovation to the lateral rectus from the sixth nerve nucleus. Because of that, some fibers of the third nerve particularly the medial rectus subnucleus, go and innovate the lateral rectus. This causes an abnormal action of the lateral rectus when it was actually supposed to be absolutely passive and there should have been no contraction. It should have relaxed. Based, so because of that, we see a lot of features related to uh, the abnormal co-contraction that we are seeing. Be besides uh, the abnormality in the lateral rectus, the other important thing is that the medial rectus is now getting less than normal innervation. So it's a kind of paralyzed muscle. Although we are seeing esotropias in them, we are seeing a tight medial rectus in them. The reason why it is again a tight medial rectus with a tight forced action test is actually because some of the myofibrils that were there in the medial rectus were not innervated. These myofibrils then degenerate to become fibrotic tissue and that contracts causing the tight FTT particularly seen in esotropic duans. And then of course there is a whole lot of secondary muscle changes. So you have a relatively similar pathophysiology but a huge variable presentation we'll see and that requires a unique approach to manage every case of duans. The aim can be to reduce the deviation in primary position, to manage or reduce the abnormal head posture the patient may have, to maintain binocularity, disfiguring retraction and upshoots and downshoots. We will just run through a couple of cases and try and see how we can have a kind of customized approach to every case of duans. This was a young girl with an left eye esotropic duans, good stereopsis, again something we see in duans because the angle of deviation is moderate. It's not a very high deviation. So the patient is able to find a, a head posture that permits binocularity. So they would have a head posture, have fairly good binocularity, and but when they look straight, they're going to have the esotropia manifest and the head posture often is a little more than the primary gaze deviation you are seeing. So this is a classic case of a typical case of an esoduance. Now, when you come across an esoduance, your management options would be depending upon one, the angle of deviation and two, are there any co-contractions or abnormal retractions that we are seeing because of the abnormal innervation to the lateral rectus? A small angle esotropia with no co-contractions, you can plan with a small medial rectus recession. A larger deviation, you would have to do a greater amount. But the rule goes that do as little medial rectus recession as possible and we'll just discuss why. So you may have to get a transposition procedure to augment that small medial rectus recession to improve the outcome. And of course, if there is a co-contraction, you will have to add a lateral rectus recession to improve or to, ver or to reduce the co-contractions. And of course, bilateral, you may have to do that surgery in both the eyes. So in this patient, we did a small medial rectus recession. You can see she was aligned in primary gaze. However, you can see the adduction deficit that is there. So we started off by saying that the medial rectus is actually weaker. And that's what you're seeing in this patient. You're seeing the adduction deficit that is there. The, this much amount of recession if you had done in a competent strabismus would not have resulted in any adduction deficit. So be very careful in the amounts of medial rectus recessions you're doing. So 
do not do large medial rectus recessions in the same eye. Always remember, if there is co-contractions, you may have to do differential recessions, recess both the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. Otherwise, you may have something like a simultaneous abduction or a synergistic divergence because the lateral rectus starts now contracting on attempted adduction against a further weakened medial rectus. It was already too weak with start with and you have now further weakened the medial rectus. So, essentially titrate the medial rectus recession based on the forced action test. A child with a much larger ezod ones, you can see the deviation is much more. In this patient, we did a very small amount of medial rectus recession, essentially to free the FTT and did a superior rectus transposition. You can see the increase in the abduction that, that the patient has got. So transposition procedures can help to increase some amount of the abduction that is not existing in the preoperative period. Advantages of transposition, it gives greater abduction versus MR recession alone. The more important thing is that you can do a lesser amount of medial rectus recession for that correction of that deviation. And of course, do not do SRT or a vertical rectus transposition if there is co-contraction because it's going to worsen the co-contraction. So uh, you can do SRT or VRTs, again, depending on what you prefer. Because we already almost always tackle the medial rectus, you can only transpose one muscle. So one muscle transposition, conventionally SRT, but now even inferior rectus transpositions have been reported. Uh, LR sections in ones up till now were an absolute no-no. And I would still say that <coughs> I personally have never tried it, but it has been mentioned. You can do a very, very small amount of resections to correct small residual esotropes, provided they don't have any retraction. Otherwise, it will become significantly worse in the post-op period. Bilateral esot ones, you may have to do the similar surgery in both the eyes. You can stage it or do it in the same go at the same time. As we mentioned about, there could be esot ones with retraction. So in this case, you can see not only is there a small esot ones, there is severe co-contraction and retraction present. In this patient, we had to recess both the medial rectus and the lateral rectus. So again, medial rectus recession did bring about a little adduction deficit, but at least we were able to manage the retraction that was there and the head posture by weakening both the horizontal recti. Exoduans actually is a more severe form of duans because the lateral rectus not only is abnormally innervated but has also gone into some amount of contracture. And usually these are patients who will have a lot more co-contraction seen. So you will see like in this patient you can on attempted adduction the eye has completely gone up into the upper lid and that's the severity of co-contraction. In this patient, we uh, so we'll just generally uh, discuss if you have normal lateral rectus activity, essentially uh, there is no retraction or shoots. You can just recess the lateral rectus to correct for the exotropia. If there is associated retraction of shoots, not only you may have to do a little greater amount of recession for the y you would for the for the upshoots or downshoots you may have to y split it to stabilize the globe. If there is subnormal lateral rectus activity but there are no retraction of shoots, you may still get away with lateral re rectus retraction. But if there are severe lateral rectus, there is severe co-contractions and severe retractions or shoots, you may have to do a periosteal fixation. In this patient, we had to do a lateral rectus periosteal fixation to correct for the angle of deviation and for the severe co-contraction. You can see the result was very good. This was another patient in which we had done the right lateral rectus periosteal fixation along with the a vertical rectus transposition to prevent a consecutive esotropia. So if you do a complete lateral rectus uh, uh, suturing to the periosteum, you have completely eliminated the function of the lateral rectus. A third of them we have seen go into esotropia. Now, of course, it's no hard fast rule, but if you have some amount of lateral rectus function in the preoperative period, there is a greater chance that these patients will go for esotropia because this was balancing in the initial period. So if there is some lateral rectus function and you have to do a periosteal fixation, do a muscle transposition also to prevent esotropia. So look for abduction. If present, add a vertical rectus transposition. Sometimes the 
co-contraction retraction can be so severe that there can be hypertropia even in primary position. Do not always think that it is because of a vertical rectus a contracture or vertical rectus abnormal innervation. Correct first the horizontal rectus retraction or the co-contraction by recessing the lateral rectus and then check often that vertical deviation may get corrected or else the SR may be actually tight because of la long standing hypertropia and may have to be recessed very mildly. Ortho duans, remember it's very very important to understand that they more likely are not going to need surgery. So unless there are retractions in shoots in which case you will have to do uh, recessions of both the uh, lateral rectus and the medial rectus in otherwise an ortho duans do not an intervene because you are more likely to end up with a more uh, an unhappy patient than otherwise so essentially indications for surgery are there choose your patients inform that that normal ductions and versions cannot be achieved your outcome is essentially primary gaze alignment and increasing the area of binocular single vision reduction in the shoots and retractions which often may remain and may not get completely eliminated Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, sir. Any questions? Uh, mean, we'll yeah, meanwhile, we'll go on to the next talk on uh, third nerve palsy, uh, case-based approach by Dr. Anand Sethi. So, sir, what, what are the situations where you would uh, decide not to touch a case of uh, Duans in terms of surgically? So, not only Duans. Uh, yeah, not only duans, I think we should remember our, our dictum that if you if you are not sure that you can make a patient better by your intervention, do not touch that patient. In duans, in paralytic strabismus that we are going to see, this likelihood is more. So particularly duans because the patient is a binocularly fusing patient most of the time mm. and he's come for a cosmetic correction. Remember, you do not want to worsen the patient. So it's very important to choose. So a patient who has, uh, who's an ortho duance or a, has a very, very small angle. Many of these patients come for noticing when they notice the abduction deficit. Remember to tell them that that is not going to be improved. If that is their primary goal, do not operate such a patient. He will always be unhappy. <laughs>